morning. A uh, warm welcome to the Innovation Factory. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to help uh, be the solution. I'm delighted to facilitate this session looking at modern methods of construction and how uh, new and innovative technology can be implemented at scale uh, across our industry to deliver on our net zero ambitions. Here at CSIC, we've, we've now supported well over 350 um, innovation projects, working collaboratively, collaboratively with industry, university experts, and the public sector on research, new products, processes, business models, and services across Scottish construction. Virtually all of these projects have had net zero carbon outcomes um, as fundamental requirements uh, for delivery. And a net zero carbon future is at the forefront of the MMC principles that both our guests today will be highlighting in their respective projects. By making very specific construction and landscaping choices, the designs help to mitigate climate change and reduce the impact of construction on the environment. They both deliver standardization and mass customization. In a sustainable manufacturing environment using low carbon, renewable resources, which will contribute both now and throughout the life cycle of the buildings. But it's not just about us speakers. We're also interested in your current relationships with MMC. So you can see on the screen, um, we've got a, 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 a poll up uh, via Slido. You can see um, the number up on the screen, 533376. If you want to whip your phones out and log on to slido.com, um, you can see the the question, which of the following best describes where you are with integrating modern methods of construction in your work or business? Advanced, highly industrialized, intermediate, utilizing some form of MMC. Not yet using MMC, but plans in place. Not yet using MMC, but researching it. Or not using MMC and not considering it. And I think that will probably remain up for the for the, for the length of this, so we can you can take your time and we can, we can um, ongo with that. So I'll introduce you to our guests. Um, Oliver Novakovic um, is Technical and Innovation Director at Barrett Developments PLC. Um, he's going to give us an insight into the Z House, a unique zero carbon concept home that showcases the future of the sustainable, of, sorry, of sustainable living in the UK. And Beverly Quinn, who's a design advisor at the UK government's Department for Education, who's going to tell us more about Gen Zero, which you might have seen in the, in the corner, a research project to deliver a new ultra-low carbon building standard for schools. A warm welcome to both of you today. So uh, in a similar way to Stephen, um, the running order will be slightly different to normal, whereby we'll, we'll, we'll hear from Oliver, and then we'll, um, any questions from the audience, we'll ask him before moving on to Beverly's presentation, and then we can have a, a, a Q&A session from Beverly. So uh, without further ado, Oliver, can you, can you hear us all right? I sure can, can you hear me? Yep, that's perfect, if you, if you wanna take it away. Sure, so I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this works and you can tell me that it works. Have you got that? Yep, that's perfect, brilliant, thank you. Great, great, so. Morning stroke afternoon, I don't think it's quite 12 o'clock yet, so morning everyone, and a bit chillier your end than my end, I hear. So I'm just going to take you through, we've just launched uh, the other day our, our Z House prototype, which is our way of combining modern methods of construction with carbon technologies, but looking at other things as well, so I'll take you through that now. Let me just make sure it works. Excellent. So the key aim for the Z House was really to challenge our supply chain to look at how, how they could apply advanced off-site construction with zero carbon combined, whilst also reducing embodied carbon. Um, there's numerous technologies and I'll take you through those. Um, and really it was very much about what, what is this next generation, you know, when we, there's no gas, reduced skill availability, so how, how are people going to react to that? And then of course we've got to scale it up and make it commercially viable. Some of these technologies are yet to have been tested at scale in the UK, um, and also the skill set that we have in the UK is not ready for them. So, so the key drivers, which is probably an interesting bit, is trying to combine 
um, what are six very different things. So uh, carbon reduction. So, you know, looking at the fabric and the renewable technology I've talked about, but embodied carbon, because uh, a lot of these sort of have a dichotomy with each other. You, you introduce one or increase one to the impact and effect of another. We also did bring wildlife into the garden, uh, another important part of the sustainability. Looked at reducing water, because it ha has a direct impact on embodied, but that could be reducing via MMC, using less wet trades on site. Health and well-being, uh, always important, especially the more we start working from home. And then finally, looking at skills and understanding and reducing, uh, or, and how those will reduce over time. We had over 40 partners in the project, um, existing partners, new partners, both for MMC and for renewable technologies, but embodied carbon and health and well-being. So we really sort of uh, pushed a net out that said, we are going to deliver the Z House. It's, it is a holistic zero carbon project, which looks at everything from, we've got plastic bottle curtains to tiles that are thinner, to obviously the standard renewable technologies to advanced MMCs. So, you know, everyone, including kitchens and others. So I'm going to take you through some of them. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm only going to, I'm not actually going to cover the wildlife nature one just because of time available. So if we just look at MMC in the first instance, uh, we started with a prefabricated uh, floor foundation, ground floor system. Um, there are a number of these on the marketplace. This is a new entrant. Um, basically, this is a polystyrene bath, I call it, which has rebar and concrete poured into it. What it does is it, it basically, if you think you can usually do sort of one to two beam and block floors, you can do five or six. And if you've got uh, fast superstructure systems, you need a fast foundation system. So this is about three times quicker. Um, and therefore you can put more floors, more floors in foundations and therefore you can follow up with more homes. Um, we then looked with our, uh, within the Barrett business, we have Oregon, we looked at a closed panel timber frame business, uh, uh, solution. I'll talk a little bit about how we combine that with windows and cladding, but just starting with the timber frame bit. So this is just a closed panel system. There are you know, a number on the marketplace where you have internal, internal skin with insulation in the middle, a number of membranes. Um, the wall was 0.19 and 0.2. And the difference is one had a brick clad outer, you'll see in a minute, and the other had a, a hardy plank, so a cement board. So that affects the U values. But we're trying to push the U values to what we thought were commercially viable. I, I know some are looking at uh, and if you look at the new section six, U values as low as 0.15. You have a step change when you go to that. So you move away from your 140 stud to having to look at much more complex buildups. So we were looking at what, what we felt would be the most viable uh, wall combined with renewables to deliver that zero carbon target. Um, we had enhanced double glazing. We didn't go with triple glazing. Uh, we had enhanced double glazing, so 1.4 to 1.2. And obviously this reduced the skills on site, but actually made us, allowed us to erect the timber frame very quickly. And um, the whole house was put together uh, in two days, and that's with cladding. Uh, cladding, one of the cladding solutions was a pre-manufactured brick wall. It was done off site. Um, we use this system for the ground floor of the house. Um, actually, on the garage, we used a through wall, which was a concrete insulation and brickwork solution. Um, of course, the, the key benefit to this is we didn't need a brick layer on this site. Um, we also used on one of the elevations no scaffold, so we looked at a system where you could also be scaffoldless. Um, and of course, because it was factory based, there was no waste around brick cuts and mortar. The other cladding system was the hardy plank, which was prefixed in on one of the elevations. And, and you can see here, uh, this was the uh, scaffoldless erect side uh, with windows in it. And then it was put down, the zipping up, as I would call it, of the hardy plank was done via a cherry pricker on this side. Um, I mean, you know, I think, uh, you know, 
you'd have to say one of the benefits of the technologies like Hardy Plank is not only are they sort of A1 non-combustible, which is important, uh, also the embodied carbon of them are lower than brickwork. I'm not, you know, so there's a combination here if we're going to reduce our embodied carbon of different types of planning. Have to take account that planning plays an important role in that and impacts on choices that we make. But also, you know, there's a lot of recycled content in the Hardy Plank solution. I must say there are other products similar to Hardy Plank, but we used Hardy Plank on this project. We also integrated a fully finished roof on the ground uh, where we also put in a solar panels. So what you can see on the ground there is solar panels on a uh, trust solution. Uh, we actually used, uh, I think in a second I'll talk about light steel uh, tiles. And the reason for that is if you try and lift that roof with normal tiles on, you could add three to four extra tons onto it. And frankly speaking, for position we were in, we just couldn't get a crane big enough to do that. Um, I think, I mean, it's, it, I mean, sort of from an energy point of view, there's around 25 uh, tiles delivering, as you can see, the 6.7. I mean, the, the, the best way for me to sometimes explain it is that it, the, the house basically runs itself from its own energy for six days of the week. It does have two batteries in the loft. It also can use the battery in the car to circulate the energy. Um, so you make the energy um, when the sun's out, store it and bring it back in at night time when most people need the use of it. So. Been on the steel uh, truss system, um, obviously a lot lighter. There's only two mil thick. Um, has a reduction on the carbon footprint compared to some traditional methods of tiling and uses recycled content. I mean, I must please note, you know, I'm not saying this is what's going to take over for the future. It's, it's highly used in Australia and other countries, but it's just us looking at certain innovations that could come into enforcement over the next few years. We go on to the low carbon heating solution that we will use. So, uh, of course, you'd, you'd have seen, and, and there's been a lot of drive around air source heat pumps. So, you know, a lot of it, I mean, for, for, for a lot of us, uh, we used this type of technology quite a number of years ago um, when you had the code sustainable homes and our requirements. But that now we're re looking at some of these air source heat pumps. And I have to say, so far, we've been impressed with they're much quieter, um, quite simple to introduce uh, with, not, you know, plumbers and electricians with the right training. There's a bit of off-site because the cylinder um, is sort of pre-plumbed and all the piping is pre-done. Um, so it's, you know, it, it is, uh, sorry, you probably can't see my screen because everyone, let's see if I can get rid of that. Yeah, perfect, sorry. So yes, so um, we're looking at, with the air source heat pump, you're looking at about carbon savings, 78%. Um, I think for me, what was interesting, obviously, that with an air source heat pump, you, I'm sure the, the audience will know, temperature of your water comes in at different, it, you know, it's 40 to 45 degrees compared to the sort of 60 and higher for gas boilers. And um, the cylinder is more complex, but the positive is um, the technology in both is quite, it is it's substantially higher around maintenance. So a lot of maintenance is done remotely and they can assess that something's going, gone wrong and, some of they, the repairs they can do remotely, others they obviously do a visit. Um, with the air source being outside, they can do that externally. The temperature of water coming in is much lower, so you've got to look at how you increase the surface area. So if we look from right to left, you know, underfloor heating, uh, uh, it's a common solution used. Um, we use a lot in apartments, but so you can, people do use it in housing. Um, you've got an innovation with the wet skirting boards. So these are skirting boards that actually water runs through. So again, it's just it's a radiator that, that looks like a skirting board, I suppose. Um, and that's quite beneficial because, you know, you're going to, some rooms, especially with smaller, you know, smaller houses with smaller bedrooms, having big radiators could not be viable. So this helps with that. But I should say, you know, as you increase the thermal efficiency of your walls and say you start getting down to those sort of 0.15s with air tightnesses of one, 
actually the amount of heating you'll need is very low. Hot water is still high, but hot heating low. So you could see electrical systems. So on the house we've tested as far left, you can see an infrared system. We have also got electric underfloor heating uh, as a solution. To sort of make all of this technology talk to each other, we've also looked at smart technology. Um, so, and the integration of it. Um, I've talked a bit, I mean, of the, around the kitchen. So, you know, you've got the plug, smart plugs and, and um, USB and charging and all that kind of stuff. As, but it's also worth noting um, that with the kitchen, we've done uh, like probably most kitchens already do recycled content. So the doors um, and cabinet boards have a minimum of 50% and doors 100% handles a coconut fiber so very much thinking about you know how we reduce carbon and content if you looked at the tiles in the pictures the, those are johnson tiles they're usually 10 millimeters thick we challenged them and so they reduced them down to eight millimeters doesn't sound like a lot but what we were able to do is take 20 percent of the embodied carbon out straight away and actually reduce uh, carbon for transport because you can you can transport more of them because they're thinner um, to site. So so we did that with quite a number of products. Asked them, do they do you need that much material in it? Can we reduce the amount of material you've got in it? Can we combine it with sort of using, if you like, advanced factory-based modern masonry approaches? Talked a bit about the, you know, the charging of the phone, but then we looked at other technology. So from far left, you've got the Frankie one, four in one electronic tap. So you could, you know, no kettle needed, so you can do hot water. You know, a lot of people see it as a fantastic toy, but actually what it does is it means people aren't boiling water substantially, you know, big kettles of water when they only use a little bit, it's sort of as you need it. We had smart washing machines where you use steam to wash your clothes. So we talked a lot about reducing water uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in showers. So 60% less water. Of course, water it uses carbon um, and the same with dishwasher. Um, and then the fridge, uh, a different type of carbon, if you like. And I think the average family wastes about 700 pounds of food a year. Um, this fridge allows your food to last anywhere between three to four days longer because it manages moisture. If you look at the smart switches, uh, we had Legrand came in and do the switches. You, you know, this is a bit behavioral. So every, every switch, you, anything you plug into a switch, you can through an app, tell how much energy it's using. I think in some ways, what they're looking at doing is a positive is that you could tell whether one of your electronics had an issue because it's using too much energy because it would know in principle how much energy different appliances should use. So that was interesting for me. But it also meant that, you know, you could do, you know, when you walked out of the house linked to the PIRs and other things, all the lights would go off and all those sort of energy saving things and linked to Google, it would also mean that you could set what lights needed to be on. Obviously all the lights were high energy efficient products. We linked in Google. So there was a lot of cameras and security um, we also looked at, you know, how it tracks your phone and, and links to when you're in and when you're out. Um, we also looked at the doorbell solution of Ken with the camera on it, but also it could tell, you know, a lot of these technologies are starting to integrate together. Um, so you can, you can actually manage the energy in the home. When are you going to be in? When do you need the energy from the battery and the like? So as I said, battery storage, we had two five kilowatt batteries uh, in the loft. This, these were pre-installed and lifted with the roof. Um, and then you had, as I said, one battery in the car, which is a 40 kilowatt battery. So you can actually use the battery in the car as putting energy into your home. So in some ways, a lot of this technology was really about you know, making the home very easy for our customer. So in a way, the customer just, they're green by just living in it normally, but actually the benefit they'll see is lower electricity and heating bills. Going to water saving. So there were, there were two solutions for water saving. One was engineered. So the Kelder shower, which you see in the picture here, 
that had um, as a minimal electric uh, um, charge, if you like, going into it, into an aerator, which basically aerates the air and atomizes it to two and a half size, so the droplets increase. So this is a four and a half to five litre shower that feels like an eight to ten litre shower. And you can see, you, you, you think to yourself, well, that, that doesn't sound like a lot, but the amount of savings a family of four could have is, is, is tens of thousands of litres of water a year. And the saving of that water has a carbon impact on it. But then separately, we had an Equaliza solution, which was a digital shower, which you turned on via your app. But probably more importantly, it told you how long you spent in the shower. So the average person spends seven and a half minutes in the shower. And most people, when asked, think they spend two to three. So it just shows, you know, it's, it's a lot about what people think when they're coming in the home. Um, and then finally, health and well-being. We're spending a lot of time in our home, so obviously creating carbon and other volatile organic compounds naturally. So, and bacteria and stuff like that, which is even more prominent, uh, you know, with what's happening. So we use a number of paints and plasters that help take volatile organic compounds out of the air. Um, so, or, you, you know, we had the Dulux Shield, which was very bacterial paint, um, looking to inhibit you know, and reducing pollution. Uh, we had some airlight products Again, eliminating, looking to eliminate bacteria and things like that. Uh, but actually, Aerolite was used from low carbon uh, paint. Bit of a lesson there, it wasn't the easiest to use, mainly used in commercial where it's sprayed. As soon as you got it on a paintbrush or a roller, it didn't quite work as we wanted. So there's quite a lot of learning from this project as well. And I haven't really touched on some of the things that went wrong. And then finally, British Gypsum have a plaster that absorbs VOCs and improves air quality. Uh, and decomposes for hold of, for moldehyde emissions. Of course, it, you know you can do all this, and it, in fact, it sounds very P, PR type project. But for us, really, it's all about monitoring. So what we've done in the house is we've got about ninety five sensors, uh, about a kilometre of um, wiring to those sensors, and we're going to have uh, a number of postgraduates living in it. We're going to look at what the temperatures like in the home, the air quality. Um, so uh, very much quantitative and qualitative data collection um, to help us understand how we should design our homes of the future that are gonna be much higher energy efficiency from a, both from a fabric point of view, but also using new renewable technology. So it's very much about monitoring how the, that, that works and what we can do with it. I suppose the other thing uh, that, that's quite critical to us is, is that the data will then inform also some of the solutions. We, you know, some of the technologies we've applied, of course, the manufacturers and others will have some great statistics on them. But sometimes those are done in controlled environments, which means that the results are what we would see on, you know, we deliver 18,000 homes plus or minus a year. And we need to understand that that's going to work on those 18,000 homes. Finally, the thing to say, a lot of uh, sensors were actually installed in the factories on the MMC and delivered to site with the sensors in them. Um, I think Salford University said this was a house that, uh, the most censored house that they'd ever had. So look forward to getting those results. I talked a little bit about vehicle to grid technology. So this is the battery. But what we've, we've got a smart system that looks at how everything works. So how much you're getting off the PVs, how much you're getting from the grid, how much is stored in the battery, and then how do you push that into your car, your washing machines and other products, but also how does the car push that back? So uh, I think as we move towards uh, a zero carbon future, no gas boilers, uh, it's quite commonly known that there's going to be some pressure on the infrastructure, especially the electrical ones. So, these type of technologies where they manage energy smartly, so Octopus are the partner in this from a smart energy point of view, in some ways hopefully re well, will reduce the demand on the grid, but also, most importantly, reduce the bills on our customers. And I suppose currently that, that's quite a, uh, an emotive subject, it is the cost of energy. So some of the lessons initially learned, when I have to say we're generally currently just looking at those, 
but definitely the integration of the different MMCs and how they align and how you design them together and how you, you know, because you're joining things together, you've got to think about sometimes how you hide those joints. Um, we had NHBC on this journey with us. They've got to think about, you know, there's a few changes about, you know, so some of the cladding, the, the standard ways of using ties has changed. I actually think a lot about design and house layout, both for the MMC and the renewable technology. So that house that we built, which um, is a four bed, that usually wouldn't have a cylinder covered, but we had to put one in because of the air source heat pump. Um, there was definitely a, an issue that everything had its own app. So every, I mean, like I said, I, I think we've got well over 40 technologies in there. So we've got well over 40 apps and that's quite problematic because, you know, as a customer, you don't have 40 apps, you need one app that does it all. So that's definitely a challenge we've sent back. Um, and a lot of the technologies were new into our marketplace and that became quite obvious. So, you know, we had a dedicated team on one house so we can manage it. We've taken a lot of lessons and fed that back to the, the supply chain, um, but that needs to have improved by the time we're looking to deliver, you know, thousands of these. And, and I suppose the other lesson is there's some really great innovations out there. Um, and actually the combination of advanced offsite construction with some of the renewable technologies goes really well. Um, we're looking, we're going to develop some sort of lessons learned. We're having a lot of tours where we're bringing both internal and external stakeholders. Um, and as part of our AMCH project, which is uh, funded by the Innovate, is the Z House has been, so we've really been able to bring an eclectic group of different people, continue working with partners. So they're also going to, they've taken a lot of learning because a lot of them may have not spoken to other people impacted whether that's MMC or renewable technology or embodied carbon or water or nature. Um, obviously, we've been doing a sort of time in motion study of the whole project and looking at waste, which we're putting together. Um, we are actually, this was our first concept house. We're now looking to do this on a couple of sites with many, with more units. And then, of course, you know, we've probably looked to, you know, as always, we've, you know, people come out of the woodwork when you've built something to say, well, actually, you could have used my technology, so we might retrofit that or look to use that in other technology, in, in, in other trials. Stop sharing. Sam? So that, that's that from me. That's fantastic. Thanks, Oliver. And I think it's, uh, yeah, incredible to see the level of uh, thinking and detail that's gone into the technology um, within the house. I suppose. One thing, well, certainly from my perspective, um, would be uh, thinking about, um, you'd mentioned about the monitoring, etc., cetera, um, and whether or not, um, or I know you will have, but it'd be interesting to hear about how it was quantified in terms of monitoring the actual manufacturing um, and the, and the off-site element um, of things around. You mentioned wastage, labor hours, productivity, diversity of workforce, etc., and whether or not that level of enhanced industrialization is likely to be taken forward for, for future Barrett um, considerations and developments? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so if we just take the closed panel technology, um, there's a big push by uh, Homes England in England um, to move towards more advanced technologies and we needed to understand what, what that actually meant. So uh, from a monitoring point of view, we've done monitoring, collected all the costs and looked at, so you can't easily build closed panel uh, technology in standard, if you like, um, less automated factories where they're not ready for that type of turning the panels over, putting the insulation on, then putting another skin on, then possibly putting cladding on. So there's quite a lot in our Oregon factory of learning about what would it take to set up a factory to be able to do closed panel. And when we got on site, we actually employed a, um, a graduate from Salford University, spent full time on site and used an iPad and every 15 minutes take information about value added and non value added uh, uh, jobs being done. So we understand waste, not just for materials, but actually for people. Mm -hmm. um, now we collate that and we send that back into the system to say, you know, because you made the following design decision in MMC, it took someone five times longer on site. So you need to change that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that, that then feeds into driving efficiency designed for manufacture uh, into the process and industrializing it. So. Brilliant. 
Excellent, thank you. Well, we'll, we'll open it to the floor. Anyone, uh, anyone have any questions for Oliver? Come on. Yes, at the back there. Hi, Billy here, Glasgow Caledonian Uni. I've always got a question if no one else has one. <laughs> um, as a former construction site manager, um, prefabrication MMC, the nightmare is always the tolerances and the interfaces. And you've, you've obviously mentioned a little bit about that already, but anything in particular you want to expand on? Was, was anything difficult? Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I mean, we, we had uh, eight, you know, eight metres by two and a half metres brick walls uh, that, have to, that had plus or minus five mil tolerance with a timber frame that I think is plus or minus 10 mil tolerance with a, um, a splash course, which is for those that aren't from construction are, are the bricks underneath in the foundation up, uh, up to the, if you like, the bottom of the foundation is called the splash course and aligning all of those so that, that you get it straight. If I'm honest, it's probably impossible. It is for me anyway, and I'm an ex site manager. So, so what you do is you don't try and do the impossible. That's the trick. That, that's what people try and do. They, they complain that you bring seven different things together that all have a tolerance and they don't align. So don't align them. <laughs> so that's what we do. We make it such that actually you, you increase that tolerance and actually make it a feature. So the joint is a feature. So where two things come together, you either, you either make it a feature or you hide it. Yeah. You do one of those two and then you don't have construction guys spending days and days trying to get something within a millimeter. And I always say to people, you've got to remember, you know, we're talking about plus or minus five millimeters with MMC. Traditional construction is plus or minus an inch. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, to, you've got to put things... So, and sometimes you're combining traditional construction, which is plus or minus, I shouldn't say an inch, actually, it's probably plus or minus more like 10, 15, 20 mil with MMC. So, yeah, I mean, so big... So even, we, we you know, I, I speak as if we got them all right. We didn't. <laughs> um, but we definitely learned where we need to change a few things. So one of the biggest mistakes, things we learned, was about how you get the... Um, hardy plank and the brickwork to not we try to align them but in the end we decided much better not to align them and have a step in them so so lots of learning there great thanks yes hi oliver chris brown from igloo love love seeing how you've uh, you've developed all the innovation over the last few years um i want to ask about really a post-occupancy thing so you talked about the 40 apps and just any thoughts you've got about how you bring those together, but also how you bring future maintenance together and rationalize that for the occupier? Yeah. It, I, I smile because Salford University have said to me, you know, Oliver, God, you should lead this and, and get Google and all these guys just to have a single app. And that scared the bejesus out of me because I basically build houses. I don't do software. Um, so, but it, but it has to be done. Um, and luckily enough, I've currently, you know, we, we have got the Googles and the Apples in the world listening to us a little bit, a tiny little bit. And I'm sort of saying, look, guys, my customers, they just want one app that combines it all together. How, how do we do that? I, I think, I think we, we will advise it. But I think the way it will happen is someone similar with, like you do with other, I mean, I, I do a lot of um, sports um, running, cycling and stuff like that and there are apps that combine it all together so I've voted with my feet as will our customers so if they don't do it and they don't open source, someone will do it and then they'll, they'll lose a march on the marketplace so I think our job is we've highlighted that they don't talk to each other and I know that because I'm trying to make them work, I've got my phone and I've got all 40 apps on it and it's driving me mad, so much so I've got my 15 year old son looking at it because um, he's, he's much better than I am at this stuff. But uh, if someone turns up tomorrow and says, actually, you don't need those 40 apps, here's one, I'll be going to that one app and they can forget about their app straight away. So I think people will, will vote with their feet. I, I think also, if I'm honest with you, post-occupancy evaluation stuff, just to link on that, I, I think this house should be fit and forget. 
in a way, I don't want my customers to have to do apps to make the home work. I, I want them to work on their own. So I talked about the air source heat pump, which I was impressed with because it uses technology, it uses like things in jet engines where they measure the amount of CO2 coming out or the amount of the temperature of the liquid. And if it changes, they'll know what's in principle going wrong and then they need to fix it because it will give codes. Um, and that kind of technology in a way is a fit and forget. It's a very complex technology, but hopefully my customer has nothing to do. The first thing my customer should have is a phone call from one of the suppliers of air source heat pumps. We think you're going to have a problem and you're not going to get hot water. Can we come and serve it? Dear? So, yeah. Yeah, that will be, uh, that will be uh, exceptional when that starts happening, Oliver, I think. Um, any other questions? Stephen at the back there. Hi, Oliver. It's Stephen Garvin here at Building Standards Scottish Government. Oliver, you work for a major uh, house builder, and clearly this innovation has been driven, uh, I would imagine, from the top, and you're at the centre of it. But how do you roll that out across the UK uh, and, and uh, presumably to possibly sceptical MDs who have got a profit mar uh, profit target to hit. Yeah, hi Stephen. Is it the same Stephen we used to work together at BRE? The, yeah, yes, the, very, we did. the very one. <laughs> hey Stephen, hi mate. Um, so, um, let me tackle that in two ways. So, how do I get MDs to change? I'm, I make it I make it easier for them and their team to use this technology and make more profit and get their bonuses. That's how I have to do it. If I can, you know, they should be using this because it's the right stuff to use to make it easier for them to do their jobs, to deliver and maintain the high quality homes that we need to. So you need to understand their psyche and develop innovations that meet their psyche. Um, of course, they have to recognise that they're going to have to deliver zero carbon homes very quickly, soon. So they're going to have to do this anyway, um, and we're just making it easier for them. I, I think it's, I mean, you, you know me a little bit, Stephen, anyway, but, you, you know, my objective is, yes, of course, as Barrett, we need to develop the solutions and, and that benefit us. But as importantly, and it, this does come from my chief exec, and, and it's true, I feel that what we're doing should be helping the small and smaller companies and, and we regularly do sessions with them and the way that happens is in this partnership you know i'll have people like travis perkins and Jusons, and all my suppliers will be servicing small house builders i think the difference is I, I have quite a technical team behind me so in some ways we are pushing the supply chain because we have uh, engineering backgrounds like myself that say well why is that and we've a lot of small house builders, you know, the, the, sadly, the MDs, the technical director, the commercial director, the operational director, and part-time bricklayer when he needs to be or she needs to be. So they haven't got the time like I have. So by doing that, so it, the, 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 the model rotates and the, the, um, the Travis Perkins, Jusons, or, or the supply chain become their technical teams. So they tell them what to do and how to do it. But realistically, they've learned that from, from me and us bigger guys, because we have taken the journey with them and told them all the problems. So I feel it's incumbent on us to share that information with them so they can then share it with the smaller house builders. But obviously you've got the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, which is another way that we take our data and that gets transferred into the smaller um, house builders. And, and of course they can, you know, that, that's part of a great objective. So, well, that's... Not to, I, I sound so positive, which is a good thing today, but um, it's tough culturally. You know, you, you, you do sometimes have people that have been building block and brick houses very successfully for many years, and culturally you are introducing change. And I, I personally believe we change with a carrot, not a stick. But I'm not lying that sometimes you have to be strong uh, in your change and say, no, no, this is you've got to do it because... You know, they go through that pain barrier before they take it up. 
Oliver, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, need to press on because I'm at a, a risk of outdoing Stephen at overrunning on, uh, on sessions. So thank, thank you very much again. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to our next presentation. Thanks. Thanks so Tom. I'd like to... Yeah, well done. So I'd like to welcome uh, Beverly Quinn, as I said, Design Advisor at the UK Government's Department for Education, who uh, is going to give us uh, some more information on, on Gen Zero, uh, which is a research project to deliver a new ultra-low carbon building standard for schools. Um, thanks very much, Sam. So yes, I am a Design Advisor from the Department for Education. So. Gen Zero is a four million pounds um, research project and it's between the DFE, Department for Education, Innovate UK and the Construction Innovation Hub. So the first part was the kind of desktop based research. So we had quite a, a fantastic team involved in that. So the organisations, um, this is a, a variation between funders, um, the original design team from the research, and then those who have been involved in developing our prototype for us, which I think some of you came along to see this morning in the tours. So one of the key aspects of Gen Zero is that it's um, designed um, you know, for, with nature in mind. So we're having these um, outdoor classrooms, so covered outdoor learning areas, which have huge benefits for, for the children, which is, which is great. And I'll just mention that all of the, any roof surfaces will, will have photovoltaic panels on them to assist with kind of balancing out our, our carbon, which is great. You might have noticed the, uh, the trees that, we, that we've brought in here um, for, for the, the exhibition. So this is to just kind of showcase that part of Gen Zero is the, the biophilic design element, which is really, really important. And, you know, there's multiple studies show that it, you know, it really helps the, the children learn and feel comfortable in the environment. Um, and also kind of moving on, from, you know, inside the building with the biophilic design element, you probably noticed that the classroom is all exposed timber inside. So that's just a kind of um, visual of what the classroom would look like. So the, the, wall, the walls, um, were constructed here at Construction Scotland Innovation Centre over in the Vacuum Press, which is the, the only one in the UK, and it's, it's all homegrown timber. The, the rest of, for, for the rest of the, the, the elements for the kit of parts, they were taken up to Invergordon and developed by Ecosystem Technologies to create the kit of parts, and then they were brought back down Hopefully this slide ties in the way I'm thinking. So you'll see, we've got the CLT wall panels, we've got the glue and columns, we've got the bamboo um, worktops, we've also got some homegrown home spruce um, worktops which were also developed here in the factory. Um, you, you might notice as well, we don't have any um, nasty paints or chemical finishes. It's all going to be left very exposed. Um, also contributing to the ultra low carbon aspect of the construction. We've cut away anything like, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of like the um, skirty boards, you know, things like that, that's maybe not quite necessary. All of the furniture can be sanded down or taken apart in the kind of um, techie department if need be. So it's, it's all really simple. All the furniture can be moved around. There's not going to be any fixed fittings or fixtures, which is great. And the the timber, it's throughout the building, so that's, we've seen a classroom space before, and now that's just a kind of store, kind of meeting area. So you'll probably notice as well that the windows are present, you know, all over. So we wouldn't just leave a kind of, a space that, you know, might only be occupied for 15 minutes, so typically might not have the same daylighting requirements. They all have um, access to daylighting, which is great. Um, built for low environmental impact, so that was another really key aspect of the design. So the original research project, we took two sites, one in Crawley, which I think is about 30 miles south of London, and the other one was in Birmingham. And this image is from Crawley, so you'll probably notice that the, the building's kind of been split up, so the... 
We've got the, the teaching wing, the comms and the halls. And that's, that you know, provides daylighting and all the spaces are quite a lot of glazing so you can look through and enjoy the landscaping. Um, we've got the, the roof lanterns and we've also um, got the, the cross flow ventilation. So one other thing to note is that our output specification for all new school buildings in England is released this month and we have managed to take aspects of Gen Zero and implement that quite quickly. So the original research was carried out um, between 2019 and 2020. So that's quite a, a good achievement. So cr and cross ventilation is one of those, um, cross flow, sorry, is um, one of those um, items that we've managed to take forward quite quickly. So the, yep, design for manufacture and assembly. So we've got a combination of panelized and volumetric um, construction and the Next slide is, I'm not sure if you can see it, but that little yellow um, highlight, that's just to show what the, the prototype that we've got exhibiting here, and um, that's just a little small cutout. We didn't want everyone to think that the DFU were um, building port -a cabin type um, schools, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so we're testing out different um, construction um, methods for the different parts of the building. So one of the things that we're doing to take Gen Zero forward is that we're hoping to develop quite quickly other prototypes. Um, we're, we're calling it sustainable pods. So that, that's really quite, quite interesting and that's, it's in development right currently. The, this is the exploded kind of parts of the prototype that we are exhibiting here, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, just so many parts and it can be manufactured in a factory and then that's just the, the, the wall panels being um, a bit of a demo of them being constructed in the factory and essentially the plan is that we would manufacture off-site and then deliver to the school and construct it on site. So this um, is the prototype coming from Invergordon back down to the factory for the exhibit. So part of this transportation is really key in the research as well and some non-construction kind of colleagues at the DFE ha had a couple of concerns. You know, can, can you actually transport this, you know, down for the exhibit? And we know we had, we had to make it clear there's a much larger problem if we can um, transport one classroom if we want to do it for, um, for all the schools um, in the future. So that was um, a good success there. Um, so just kind of showing the, the sports hall timber structure. So just to kind of mention as well that in order to keep progressing Gen Zero and the findings from it, we're, we're currently looking through our kind of pilots and pathfinder projects that are part of the school rebuilding program. And the idea is that instead of just developing Gen Zero for new build, we'll actually see what we can implement into the existing school stock because it's so large. Um, we, you know, we might possibly look at replacing sports blocks or, you know, like, like little parts. So that's, that's under development. We're just looking through the, the schools just now to see which might lend themselves well to this. Um, that's just a kind of visual of the, the commons. So you'll be able to see that it's a really, be really nice environment to kind of sit and chat and have your lunch and things like that. So. Um, one of the other really major parts of the research is the kind of standardizing throughout the building. So within the DFE, we have a design team and it's a really good combination of kind of ex-construction industry professionals. So we've got lots of different teams um, further developing different aspects of Gen Zero. Um, and we're working on this 1.8, 3.6 grid. And this can be lends itself really well to off-site manufacture. And one of the other aspects is that we, ideally we want to take this across government departments and not just for education. So we'd be looking to develop a kind of standardized product design and take that forward. And as you can see, the 
the grid, you might have noticed that the, the like the lights are on the grid, like the glazing's on the grid, everything's built on this grid. That you know the partition walls can can go anywhere, which is great. Um, so as you can see, that's just a combination of spaces that all fit very nicely onto the grid as well. And that is just a kind of a little moving around of the wall, just to demonstrate that that all works. That's the lighting. And this is just a kind of quick build up of the construction of what it would be like on the site. So design for manufacture. So the toilets and kitchens and changing um, blocks would essentially be manufactured off site and then delivered to site. So we're, we're looking to further develop that as well. Um, so the, the designs would be suitable you know, for transport on UK roads, which is great. And that's just some of it coming together. Apologies, because this is supposed to be um, animated. It's not quite, uh, not quite working. So these are just some of the, the volumetric units. It's kind of a quick demo. Um, just kind of moving on to the standardization of the services. So we are currently kickstarting a kind of side project from Gen Zero Energy Pods, which is developing low carbon modular plant rooms. And we're looking at this initially for the existing school stock to see how we can take that forward, because that's the kind of the, the most pre pressing issue at the moment. So the idea, it, we, we would have, um, I suppose, a menu of, of plant that you know we could pick from, and we could, you know, swap out the plant with limited um, disruption to the schools as possible, and kind of roll this out on mass scale. So that that's really exciting. And again, we're just looking at which kind of schools we can take this forward in first. Um, I think I'd briefly mentioned the furniture before. So the looking at the furniture was part of the original Gen Zero research, and. The, the furniture that we actually have, and it's by Chalk Creatives, and it's all been made bespoke for, for the prototype, so it's prototype furniture. And you might have noticed there's not any you know, dip coating or any kind of harsh chemicals. They've actually, I think it's, they've rubbed beeswax on the metal to kind of treat it in a more natural way. And that's kind of all under development. The furniture as well, it's been designed to be moved around, so nothing's fixed. Um, which just really lends itself well to the change of use in the spaces. Um, just quickly moving on to carbon and timber. So as you can see there, so using the, the homegrown timber element um, allows us to sit quite nicely within the 20, 30 targets when we include for the sequestration. Um, in terms of operational carbon and energy, um, we we have actually implemented net zero carbon in operation in our spec as of this month. So that will be for all new build projects. And to support this and not kind of leave designers in the lurch, we're also developing um, operational energy modeling guidance and standard templates, again, which ties into the kind of wider digital digitalization that we're, that we're doing. So we've got really great kind of teams working on that with, at the DFE. And just a little figure about the energy results. So the darker blue in the middle is Gen, is gen Zero, and that is the kind of results from the, the Crawley project, which the images have been of so far. And the kind of lighter blue is the um, kind of standard um, before Gen Zero, the kind of current specification. So it's, it's come a really, really long way, and we have a kind of internal IT team as well, who've worked really, really hard um, to kind of bring down the, the energy usage from the IT equipment. And they had quite a lot of concerns that the, the kind of what, what people wanted was maybe to use IT less, but that, that's not the way that the world's going, obviously. So they've looked at you know, how, how we can reduce the energy um, usage from, from the equipment instead. So that's, a, that's another kind of big standalone project on its own. Um, the next step, so I think I have mentioned quite, of these, um, quite a lot of these throughout, so the energy pods, the pilots and pathfinder projects, um, these existing school stock, the sustainable pods, which will be more prototypes, um, and yeah, we're doing um, testing of the prototype. So.
that's all for me. Um, thank you very much. And I'll take questions if there's time, but you can come and grab me over at Gen Zero anytime today. Thank you.